All right, so we're going to look at a couple of different ways that uh, this, your state of consciousness could be altered through dreams, hypnosis, and meditations. First, dreams. Um, what's interesting about dreams is we're still like really unsure why they happen, right? There's there's not a sense of why they happen, but um, we all dream every night, and we generally we don't always remember our dreams. Um, so we've got to figure out what's going on. And there's a few theories floating around out there that we'll talk about. But there seems to be some meaningful things that are happening um, psychologically and physiologically. Uh, and so we see that during dreams, there is neural repair happening. There's any damage to neurons or the building of new neurons um, or the pruning of neurons occurs at this time. We also see the consolidation of memories occurring and protein synthesis. So it is an important time. Although we don't fully understand it, we know that these important things are happening during this time. And again, the functions of dreams are unknown, but the three major theories behind them are wish fulfillment, problem solving, and activation synthesis. And we'll look at each of them. The first is wish fulfillment. And this theory is proposed by uh, Sigmund Freud, a uh, psychoanalytic psychologist, and he argues that our dreams are our expression of our unconscious wishes or desires. Um, and we express those unconscious wishes and desires in our dreams. And he argues that there's two different contents occurring here. And those two different contents are manifest content, which is the storyline and imagery of our dreams. Um, that is what actually happens when you're recounting, man, I had this crazy dream last night, da 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 um, and he argues that this offers insight into important symbols that relate to unconscious processes that we have. And uh, that is the manifest content. And then he argues for something he calls the latent content. And that is the emotional significance and the underlying meaning of your dreams. Like, why did that dream happen, right? And so those two different contents, he argues, uh, can give deep insight into our psyche, into who we are as an individual. But his real big argument for dreams is that that is where our wishes are fulfilled. Any desires that we have in life are fulfilled and expressed in our dreams. The problem-solving theory is, is put forth by Rosalind Cartwright, and uh, she argues that dreams are a time for our mind to work out any issues that we are facing in our daily lives. And so it's a chance for us to kind of process and problem solve things that we are experiencing during our waking hours while we are asleep. And this is helpful because our dreams are not constrained by realism or by logic. And because they aren't constrained by that, um, it allows us to find new creative ways to solve our problems. And this is also called cognitive, right? Because you have a lot of, according to Cartwright, you have a lot of thinking that's actually occurring. So issues that draw our attention during waking hours are stored somehow residually. Then at night, our mind has a chance to process through these things and try to work out any issues that we are feeling. The last uh, theory is called the activation synthesis model. And J. Allen Hobson is the one who pushes through this idea. Uh, and he and his team argue that um, dreams are simply a, a result or a byproduct or a side effect of our awareness of neural activity while we are sleeping. So uh, the basic argument is this, is while we are sleeping, our neurons are firing in, in lower brain centers, specifically in the pons, right? So he says that there's some neural movement activity happening at that, at that stage. And our brain, our cortex, the thinking center of the brain, is trying to make sense of these signals. It's not receiving sensory input or not receiving much sensory input while we're asleep, but yet there's neural impulses happening. And so our cortex constructs dreams to make a sense of these signals that it's receiving from the pawns. Um, and so he argues that this is why we dream, because there's these occasional neurons firing, and our brain's not sure what to make of it because it's not receiving sensory input. It's just these neurons firing. So it creates dreams for us as an explanation. Because of this, Hobson really downplays how meaningful dreams really are. He doesn't say they have no meaning, but he downplays their meaningfulness as opposed to uh, Cartwright and Freud, who argue, obviously, you know, if they're your wish fulfillment or if it's a way to problem solve, those are obviously significant, uh, significantly meaningful. 
so those, those are the theories of dreams. And the last thing we'll touch on briefly is this difference between what are called nightmares and night terrors. Um, nightmares are dreams. They are elaborate dream sequences that create fear, anxiety. Um, maybe you experience a sense of physical danger for yourself or somebody you love. Maybe some sense of extreme embarrassment or fear um, for the dreamers. They are very vivid and they can be described by the person who experiences them when they wake up. And generally, well not generally, these occur during REM sleep. Okay, They occur during REM sleep. The difference is then night terrors occur in stages three and four when we're not in REM sleep. That's our NR, NN, NREM sleep. Um, and they involve behaviors such as screaming out, crying, or jerking and lunging movements around in your bed or wherever it is that you're sleeping. There's some thought that this overlaps with sleepwalking. Um, and what we see is that people may go through all the motions of being attacked by some horror while they're fully asleep, screaming out, trying to fight back, doing these sorts of things. And these are generally not remembered because they're not necessarily these in-depth dreams that nightmares are. The night terrors are different. They happen in a different stage of sleep where our body is less, uh, less near the level of consciousness. If you recall back, um, REM sleep we, it occurs with the, um, with the beta waves. And so you're basically occurring while you're awake. Um, which is in which is different. So you're near that state of consciousness. Whereas night terrors occur in stages three and four when you're in the real like delta waves, real deep, near unconscious state. And so you don't remember these night terrors. You do remember these nightmares in general. In general. And that's the difference. Those are dreams, as you will call them, uh, that we experience. As far as hypnosis goes, um, hypnosis is interesting, right? Uh, it's an altered state of consciousness where the hypnotized person is very relaxed and they're open to suggestion uh, from the hypnotizer. Um, and there's two, or there's a couple major theories. The first is that hypnosis is just role playing and that people are behaving as they think they're supposed to behave. So this kind of downplays the kind of importance and significance of hypnosis. And it's just saying, look, these people are just playing along because they think that's what they're supposed to do. And so that's what they are doing. And that's kind of a negative view of it, but that's the way it is. The other viewpoint is um, hypnosis as being disassociative. Um, and dissociative means that there's kind of the, you're able to remove yourself or put your mind in two different places. So Hilgard is the man who uh, is, is responsible for this theory. And Hilgard suggests something called the, the hidden observer. Uh, and in this, he says that the hyp hypnosis divides the mind into two different parts. One part obeys the hypnotist. Right? I'm re responding to the hypnotist. The other, which is the hidden observer, just silently observes everything. It's this idea of there's disassoci disassociation between the two parts of the mind. And that somehow we're able to separate those things. What's interesting about hypnosis is that not everyone is susceptible to it. Some people are more susceptible than others. Um, and some people simply can't be hypnotized at all. Um, and so hypnosis is kind of one of those fields that there's some possible benefits to it. But people are kind of always a little bit uncertain about. And then the last is meditation. And meditation is any number of techniques that involve training someone's attention to focus on a single thing, which is what we call focused attention, or expanding kind of your attention to allow you to become more of a detached observer. So you essentially either hyper-focused or try to remove yourself entirely from any focus whatsoever. Uh, and meditation is really helpful in that it can help manage pain, stress, anxiety disorders, um, any of those sorts of things. It can be used as a tool to manage those issues. And what we see is when people meditate, they have increased alpha and theta waves. And those are the brainwave activity. And those are the uh, brainwaves of when we are kind of drifting into um, a relaxed state or even drifting off to sleep. And so meditation, uh, when people meditate, they're actually displaying characteristics of being asleep while they are awake and meditating. So it's really interesting. And meditation does have some really uh, promising long-term improvements, both uh, physiologically, so that increases, again, management of pain, lowering of stress and blood pressure, um, and 
heart disease and those sorts of things, but also physiologically where you can help kind of treat and manage anxiety disorder. So meditation um, definitely has a lot of positive benefits going for it, both for your mind and for your body. And so that's kind of a look at how dreams affect us, how uh, hypnosis is sort of viewed in the field of psychology, and then the benefits of meditation.